Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Voice of Faith, having your Bibles this morning. Let's open them, please, to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 16. We are dealing with the subject of covenant, our covenant with God. The title of the series is Covenant Life, Ezekiel chapter 16. We have used verse number 8 as the foundation verse for this series. And then last week, the Lord had us look at that verse in its context. And I'd like for us to read that passage again. So Ezekiel 16 and 6. Don't you feel sorry for the people who are going to listen to this message and didn't know what happened previously? (laughs) The precious moving of the Holy Ghost. But that same anointing will be on the CDs and people are going to be filled with the Holy Ghost and healed and delivered. Amen. Whether it be by internet or whatever means. Ezekiel 16, 6. And when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee when thou wast in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee when thou wast in thy blood, live. I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field, and thou hast increased and waxen great. And thou art come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned, and thine hair is grown, whereas thou wast naked and bare. Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee, and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine." Then washed I thee with water, yea, I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. I clothed thee also with broidered work, and shod thee with badger skin, and I girded thee about with fine linen, and I covered thee with silk. I decked thee also with ornaments, and I put bracelets upon thy hands, and a chain on thy neck. And I put a jewel on thy forehead, and earrings in thine ears, and a beautiful crown upon thine head. Thou wa- th- pardon me. Thus wast thou decked with gold and silver, and thy raiment was of fine linen and silk embroidered work. Thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil, and thou wast exceeding beautiful, and thou didst prosper into a kingdom. And thy renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty, for it was perfect through my comeliness, which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord God. Isn't it wonderful that God likes a little bling on his people? God is into jewelry, and as we saw last week, jewelry uh, is part of of one of the signs of covenant. It came out of covenant relationship, and God wants his children to enjoy jewelry. He likes for his children to look like they're taken care of because he wants them taken care of. Amen. Amen. Verse number 8 we've looked at. It's our main verse. The last part of it, yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. Making a promise is no light thing with God. In fact, it's so important to him that he sheds blood and he swears. When God makes a promise, he has shed blood and he swears. He does that not to make himself honest, but to cause us to come into an awareness of just how important his words are to him and how, how serious he is when he says, I'm going to do something in your life and make you this promise. We would say it like this, you could take it to the bank because it's good is done. Amen? Amen? The promises of God are the works of God. God, when God speaks something, it's not just for information purposes. God's words are creative. They don't just give information they do something. They are creative by nature. You know, when God says, for instance, you know, in Genesis 1, the Bible says that, that God says, in the beginning was the Word. No? I'm getting four verses. Hang on, hang on. I'm getting four verses confused. Y'all going <laughs> to... What I wanted to say is this, that in the beginning God said, let there be light. 
Now, that same God who said, let there be light, is the same God who said, be ye holy as I am holy. So the creative power of God is in those words to make us like him. It's not just a command we go, oh man, I can never be holy like God. No, no, the power to be holy is in the words, be ye holy as I am holy. When he says be healed, we should say, yes, sir, (laughs) I am healed. Thank you very much, sir, right? He says be holy, we should say, thank you, sir. Yes, sir, I will be holy because the power to do it is in the word. It's in those words. The promises of God are his covenants. And apart from covenant, there is no way to comprehend how loyal God is to his word, both written and spoken. This is kind of a recap of what we've looked at. And we've asked this question, has God ever made a promise to you? If he has, then he is making covenant with you. And when you say yes to him, you've entered into that covenant with him. God makes covenant with us by making promises. I love that about him. We know in Deuteronomy 7 verse, uh, chapter 7 verse 9, that our God is a God who makes covenant and he keeps covenant. He's the faithful God, amen? He is faithful. He has never lied. It's impossible for him to lie. And so if he's made you a promise, you ought to just start shouting and rejoicing because he cannot lie. It may not look like it. It may not feel like it. It may look like it's going to take 40,000 years for it to ever happen, but that's all right. God knows how to get it to you, and he knows how to get it to you right on time. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. This passage is a beautiful description of what happens to us when we enter into covenant uh, and, and into a covenant relationship with God. It's wonderful that God came by us, saw us naked, saw us bleeding, saw us broken, and he took and he took his skirt and he laid it upon us and God covers our nakedness. God is not into exposing those areas of our life that are private, that are personal, that could bring embarrassment or shame. That's the enemy. The enemy would do that But God desires to cover our nakedness, and that is a sign of him being in covenant with us. Aren't you glad that God covers our nakedness? And then after he covers us, then he gives us jewelry to wear. (laughs) We went from being naked, broken, and bleeding to moving on up to the east side. Right? We're looking looking good. Who you been hanging around with? J.C.? Good old J.C., Jesus Christ, moving on up, moving on up. And we're going to keep on moving up till we move right on up to heaven, glory to God. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Read with me, please. None of that was planned. That was all. <laughs> yeah, that was free. Yeah, it was free. No, no charge. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, please. Ephesians 2. The Holy Ghost will animate you. Thank you, Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10. Hmm. Hmm. I may need my handkerchief. I may get a little Pentecostal and wild and crazy, and I may need to shake my handkerchief. Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. So he's talking about something that we once were. At one time we were Gentiles. And we said last week that a Gentile is someone who does not know God. So it doesn't doesn't matter if you're German, Italian, French, Spanish, American. It doesn't matter. If you don't know God, you're a Gentile. 
right? You don't know God. But that was in the past. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants, plural, of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For far too long Christians have been strangers to the covenants of promise. I want you to notice something about this verse, verse number 12. Let's look at this closely. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Now watch this. And strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. I want you to notice that the Bible puts the word promise before it puts the word hope. Promise first, hope second. If we are strangers to the covenants of promise, then we are going to be without hope. Even though we're a Christian, our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, if we are strangers to the covenants of promise, we will be a people without hope. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but we live in a generation that is just hopeless. They are so hopeless. And that is why they are turning to fantasy. And, and they, they do anything like drugs, uh, anything and everything that is escapism. Because they have no hope, they can't face reality, they've got to do something so they can turn their back on and escape, and fantasy is such a big deal in our society. We are God's covenant people. We are not to be a people without hope. Faith should be an earmark of our life, but hope should also be something that is a, a major characteristic. In fact, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 13 that there are three spiritual forces that will live forever, and that is faith, hope, and charity. Those are living things, and they are to be on the inside of us, and they should be very strong in us. We are to be a people of hope. In fact, if you go to Colossians 1.23 because we're in Ephesians, if you go to Colossians 1.23, if you go to the right in your Bible, just a couple books, Colossians 1.23 tells us this, If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel... Please say, be not. Be not. Be not. Say it again. Be not. Be not. Be not. Be not. Moved, away moved away from the hope of the gospel. The of the gospel. More. 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 I'm telling you, this is your day. This is your day. I have put my foot down in the realm of the Spirit. This is your day. Thank you, Jesus. More. 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 You can get the CD next week. Don't worry about the message. You just let the Holy Ghost work on you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. This is more important. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. So there are Christians who have no hope because they are unaware, they have no knowledge of their covenant with God and that that covenant is filled with promises. The more we come into an understanding of our covenant, the more we understand how many promises God has given to us, then our hope is going to rise up within us. Amen. Now, I want to, just to make it simple today, I want us to put hope, I want us to define hope two ways. I want us to define hope as expectation, and I want us to define hope as an inner image. I'm, there's something specific I'm hoping for. I'm expecting a specific thing to come to pass. So it deals with our imagination. 
It deals with the inner image, and it deals with expectation. In fact, the, the root word of hope is very interesting. It, it literally means stretched out neck expectation. Just, you're just like so, so looking for it. You're so excited that you're just, it's like a little kid. Oh, when are we going to go, Grammy? When are we going to go to the store and get candy? That type of thing. Just intense red hot expectation. Uh, this is free. Thank you, Holy Ghost. <laughs> Do you hear about the, the mother had two, two boys, twins, and she said, how would you boys like to go see Grammy? Oh, yeah, can we go see Grammy? Let's go see Grammy. And so the mother says, go outside to the car and check the gas gauge and let me know if we've got enough to go, to the, to go see Grammy. So both boys run out, and they come back, and she said, well, what about it? And one of the boys says, oh, Mama, we can't go. The, the tank is half empty. And the other boy says, Mama, get your coat. It's half full. <laughs> As Christians, we should be reading the tank half full. Yeah. Right? Because we got a covenant with God filled with promises. Amen. Both boys were right. <laughs> but one, it, well, both are so revealing about perspective on life. huh? Praise God. And so what the boys didn't know was that there was enough gas in the car to get in, to get in the car and go to Grammy's, and on the way, we'll just stop by and fill it up. Amen. We need more, we'll just get more. All right. Be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. The gospel gives us hope. You may want to write that down. The gospel gives us hope. And then... Read with me in the book of Galatians chapter 3. Man, oh man, this be the shouting part. Glory to God. Galatians chapter 3. More. 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 Kilondorasta salololoboko. More, 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 more. Thank you, Lord, for more anointing. This is her day. This is her hour in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for more. Galatians 3. Hmm. Mm, mm, mm. I done made myself a promise that if I need me to dance, I'm going to dance. Glory to God. If I need to run, I'm going to do me some running. Glory to God. Yeah. This here is some tall cotton right here. Galatians chapter 3. Mm, mm, mm. Galatians 3 verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. Are you the child of Abraham? Alright. And the scripture foreseeing and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen. Say, that was me. We all qualified as heathen before we got saved, right? That's a Gentile. We, we all did stuff. We were all heathens. That God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham preached before the gospel. Let's read it like this. Preached the gospel before. Preached the gospel first to Abraham. The gospel was first preached to Abraham. Amen. This is so important. Do not be moved away from the hope of the gospel. The gospel gives us hope. Abraham heard the gospel first. God preached the gospel to Abraham first. Hmm. Look over this. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying, please say saying, saying. 
In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Go back to saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Here's the question. When? When did God preach the gospel first to Abraham? When did he preach it to him? When did he make this statement to him that in thee, uh, yeah, in thee shall all nations be blessed? The answer is <laughs> when he cut the covenant with him. When God cut the covenant with Abraham was when he first preached the gospel to him. Hmm. Oh, glory to God. God cutting the covenant with Abraham was preaching the gospel to him. That is so powerful. God cutting the covenant with Abraham was preaching the gospel to him. Or I could say it like this. When did, when did God preach the gospel to Abraham? When he cut the covenant with him. Here's what I want you to know besides that important piece of information. The same thing is true with you and I. We're not going to take time to turn there. You can just write down Romans 2, verses 28 and 29. Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. And Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. We've already looked at these two verses in this series. When God cut the covenant with Abraham, he was preaching the good news to him. When you and I, according to Romans 2 and according to Colossians, when you and I were born again, there is a mark on our spirit. Our spirit man has been circumcised. The old has been removed. There is a new heart on the inside of us. And our spirit man bears the mark of covenant. When did God cut the covenant with you? The day you said, Jesus, come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. Amen. Right? Amen. Right? Oh, hallelujah. Don't you know? Don't you know that, that the covenant that... The covenant, when, when God said to Abraham, Abraham, I want to cut a covenant with you. Don't you know that was good news to his ears? That was good news to him. The gospel is the covenant. The gospel is the covenant. The covenant is the gospel. For, for learning purposes... Go through the New Testament. <laughs> and every time you see the word gospel, put in the word covenant. And this book will just get up and do you a little dance. And you will understand the New Testament like you never understood it before. And it will make you start jumping around and shouting and dancing because you will understand that the gospel is covenant. For example... Luke chapter 4, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the covenant, the covenant to the poor. Oh, now I understand. Now I understand all this, this false teaching and preaching about how God wants us to be poor doesn't fit in the covenant. Amen. You can't get a Jew to believe that God wants him poor. Because it's in the covenant that he would prosper us, that he would increase us, that he would multiply us. Amen. Go through, take the word gospel out, put in the word covenant, and oh, you will understand. You will understand your New Testament more than you ever have before. And oh, it'll just dance, it'll, and it'll make you dance. And some of the mystery passages that you just never got, man, it'll just open up and you go, man, this is a whole new book. No, you're just finally reading it for the first time like God sees it. Say it with me. Say, the gospel, the gospel is the covenant. The covenant, the covenant the is, the is the gospel. Gospel means good news, right? Yeah. The good news is that God has made a blood covenant with you in the blood of his son Jesus. 
And that means that all that he has belongs to you. Amen. Hmm. Mm -mm. Lord, can I share with them? Thank you, Lord, I will. <laughs> this is also free. <laughs> Go with me to the book of Luke. This past week, I had a very interesting week with the Lord. And at 4 o'clock in the morning, the Lord gave me this verse. Now, the Lord's given me several verses out of Luke lately, so just give me a moment. Luke chapter 15. Luke 15, 32. Leanne got up early to go take pictures of the blood moon, and I opted not. And I wanted to stay home because I had some responsibilities the next day. So, but I got up, went outside and looked. Saw it, went, okay, there it is. It's been about 30 seconds out in the cold in my pajamas. Came in and I had my Bible over on, on the TV stand, which was an unusual place for me to have it. And I'm, so I'm like going to bed and I look over and I see my Bible. And this thought came to me, pick up your Bible and read it. I went, nah, I want to go to bed. I'm tired. It's 4 o'clock in the morning. Dummy. <laughs> so, once again, pick up your Bible, read it. So I went, okay. So I got my Bible, opened it up, and the Lord gave me Luke 15, 31. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Mm, thank you, Lord. I, you are ever with me, and all that you have is mine. What a covenant statement. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Can the Lord get real to you and personal with you that you're not just a, just not just a number? Amen. He knows you by name. The very hairs of your head are numbered. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Not counted. Not counted, numbered. God doesn't just know, he doesn't just know the total number of the hairs of your head. Each hair has a number. And when you comb your hair, hair number 477 may fall out with number 6,742. <laughs> and when you get to heaven, you get the original number back all right where they should be. Amen. But every hair of your hair, every hair of your head has a number on it. Yeah. Wow. That's how important you are to God. For people like you and I, I just want you to know that we may have some less numbers than we had before. But that doesn't mean he loves us any less, all right? <laughs> Hallelujah. All that I have is thine. Lord, where am I supposed to go with this message? Hallelujah. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 6, please. The covenant is the gospel. It is the good news. Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6, 13. So when God made covenant with Abraham, he preached the gospel to him. Abraham knew that Jesus was coming. Abraham knew that through his loins, the Messiah would come. Mm. How do you think that made Abraham feel? To know that through him would come the Messiah. Hmm. Hebrews 6.13. Tell me when you're there. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. The root cause of strife is not knowing your covenant. The root cause of strife in your life is not knowing your covenant. Because when a covenant has been cut, the blood has been shed, there is no more argument. There is no more debate. All strife is through. It's finished. It's, it's a done deal. And so what we need to do is we need to find out our covenant 
and then we need to stand on it knowing that strife is of the devil. And he comes to kill, steal, and destroy, and strife is one of his big ways of doing that. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immobility of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. That verse means, that verse is saying that God desires even more to show to you and I the unchangeableness of his covenant more than he did with Abraham. Now you think about whatever, whatever level of intensity of desire God had to make a covenant with Abraham, he desires even more to make a covenant with you and I. To reveal it to us, to invite us into it. And I'll tell you right now, if Abraham can become fully persuaded because of the shed blood of a heifer, you and I can definitely become more than fully persuaded because of the shed blood of Jesus. Amen. God doesn't want, want us living a life not knowing what's going to happen and how are we going to make it and all that kind of stuff. We have a covenant in the shed blood of Jesus. There should be no strife and no fear. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we may have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Whether the forerunner is for us entered even Jesus, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Two things I want you to get from there is that hope, once again, comes to us out of these covenants. Hope acts like an anchor of the soul. Everybody knows that our mind, will, and emotions is where the battleground's at. Thoughts and emotions. Thoughts and emotions. And you decide, okay, I'm going to have a strong will and I'm going I'm to do this. And then here comes the thoughts and emotions and then our will evaporates. It's, that's the battleground. But the Bible says that we have this hope. It's an anchor of the soul, and it's set before us. Our covenant with God gives us or produces within us hope. This hope is laid before us or set before us in our covenant. Let me get simple. What do you do when you lack hope? What do you do when you are hopeless? What do you do when it seems like there is no way? What do you do? We should do what Abraham did. All right, now there's a lot of things that we can do, but what we should do is do what Abraham did, and that's found in Romans chapter 4. We live in a hopeless generation, our society is hopeless. There are many Christians, unfortunately, who have no hope. They don't see their life getting any better. They don't know that there's a way out. And they are hopeless. They are without hope. But in Romans chapter 4, the Bible tells us that we are to follow in the footsteps of the faith of our father Abraham. And we're going to look at what Abraham did because he's the pattern for us. More. More, Lord. More. More. In Jesus' name, more. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Romans 4, <laughs> verse 16. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Here it is. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Abraham had no hope in the natural. There was nothing that he could look to that would give him hope that he was going to have a child. In the natural, it said to him, Abraham, when you die, that's it. No kids, forget it. It's going to die with you. When you die, when you die, that's it. But God said to him, Abraham, 
Abram, I'm going to change your name to Abraham. I'm going to change Sarah's, Sarai's name to Sarah, and you're going to have a son. So Abraham looked at his wife. She was barren when she was young. Now she's old. He looked at his body. His body was dead, meaning he was past the ability to... Yeah, <laughs> I'm losing words here. Let me move on quickly. But he got his virility back. He got his manhood back. And so, but in the natural, there was no hope. There was nothing to, for him to go. Yeah, you know, I can see God. I can see that happening. But in the natural, he had no hope. So what did he do? He got him some hope by going to his covenant. He took the words that God gave him. He took that promise and he got him some hope out of the promises of God. That's what we are to do when life seems hopeless. When it doesn't look like there's any way out, my life will never get better, I'll always struggle, I'll always live hand to mouth, I'll never own my own home, I'll never have a nice car, I'll never, 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 because it's always been that way, I can go back five generations, my family just, we've always been poor, we grew up on the wrong side of the tracks, I have the wrong skin color, I don't have a good education, I'm not smart enough, all of that, no hope. But you go to the Word, you find out your covenant, and you find out those promises, and you get hope out of the promises of God. Amen. That's what Abraham did. And when he did that, as, as he got those, those, uh, that Word, and he meditated upon it, he meditated upon it, he could begin to see himself as the father of many. His inner image began to change. And as he began to see himself different, his expectation began to rise. It began to come up. And so he ignored the natural. He wouldn't look to his wife. He wouldn't look to his body. He would only consider one thing, and that's what God said to him. And when you and I get to the place where we do not consider our circumstances, we do not consider how we feel, we consider only what God said. Glory to God, I'm preaching today, hallelujah. Mm -mm -mm. As we consider only what God said, that, that inner image changes and our expectation comes up and we get to the place where we are fully persuaded. God can't lie to me. He cut a covenant with, to, with me in the blood of this heifer. God can't lie to you and I. He cut a covenant with us in the blood of Jesus. He cannot lie. It has to happen. So then you begin to call those things that be not as though they were. I am Abraham. I am the father of a multitude. You can call me Mr. Abraham if you want. Because I've got a lot of kids. Where are they? They're on the inside of me. And they're in my covenant with God. Amen. And so you get hope where there is no hope. And as that happens on the inside of you, and as you can tell when it's growing on the inside of you because you begin to call those things that be not as though they were, then you say, okay, God, I'm doing my end. Now you do your end and you bring it to pass. Amen. You bring it to pass and he will. Amen. He will. You can tell faith people from people that are in the flesh. You can tell when your faith is growing. And this is so awesome. When your faith grows, you are more moved by what the Bible says and you're less moved by what the circumstances are saying to you. And you're less moved by what your feelings are saying to you. You're less moved by what your family is saying to you. You're less moved by what your flesh is saying to you. You're only moved by what the Bible says. And you can tell, man, my faith is growing. It's growing. And so, you know how it is, the bearer of bad news comes, knocks on your door, uh, we got this for you, we're, you're being sued, and we're taking your TV. <laughs> oh, thanks. Well, you don't need that anyway, that's nothing but bad news, news anyway. So, you know, so the situation gets worse. That's what happened to J. Iris. Jesus, come lay your hands on my daughter and she'll live. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's too late, don't bother the master, she's already dead. Jesus said, be not afraid. Only believe. Where have you heard that before? Amen. So Abraham, uh, pardon me, Jairus, decided to stay in faith. He wouldn't let that bad report affect him. Amen. Now you've got to be strong in faith when you hear that your only daughter, who's 12 years of age, is dead, and you go, I'm only looking at Jesus. He said he would come and lay his hands on my daughter. It's never too late for Jesus. 
Praise God. All right, there is a phrase in the Bible as we get close to closing here. Matthew 16, please. I want you to see. I want you to see a phrase, Matthew 16, that will give you some hope. This verse will paint a picture on the inside of you and cause you to begin to be expecting. Matthew 16, Jesus is talking to Peter. Jesus asked the question, who do people say that I am? So they were given that answer. Peter says, you're, you're the Christ. And then I want you to notice a phrase here. In Matthew 16, verse 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, not Peter, but on the revelation... Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Familiar with that? Absolutely. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want you to know that that is a covenant statement. That that statement belongs to you, and I'm going to prove it to you that this is a covenant statement. But I want you to notice, first of all, something that's interesting. This should be pretty obvious to us, but because of the way Christians quote it and talk about it, it's not. I want you to know that gates do not attack an army. <laughs> gates do not attack an army. An army attacks a gate. And most Christians, when they are under some kind of test or trial, they'll say, well, you know, the gates of hell won't prevail. Well, who's doing the, who's doing the, who's doing the fighting? Who's, who's doing the warfare? Who's doing the onslaught here? So when the devil comes to you and he's attacking you, why do we say the gates of hell won't prevail? Because gates don't go forward and attack an army. We are the army of God. We should be going against the gates of hell. They shouldn't be coming against us. Amen. This is a covenant statement. Now, I know the devil comes against us, obvious. And I understand that there's some things about gates. Like back in that time, it, the gates of the city is where the elderly men got together and they did council. And so the city council was held at the gates of the city. And so one of the things you can draw from that is that the plans of the enemy will not prevail against you. I, I get that. I understand that. But I want you to know that gates do not attack an army. I want, I want, to, I want to get you... Uh, a, 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 how do I say it, Lord? A picture on the inside of you is something that's important. This statement that Jesus gave, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you, when Jesus said that, he was thinking about Genesis 22. Please go to Genesis 22. Genesis 22. Jesus knew this verse when he said that to the, to the disciples. Jesus spoke this to them as a covenant statement because he was thinking about Genesis 22. I want you to notice what our covenant states. This is what God said to Abraham. Hmm. Let me ask you again. Are you a child of Abraham? Yes. Genesis 22, 17. So Abraham is there. He's got the knife drawn. Stop, Abraham, don't do any harm to your son. So God's talking to him. Verse 16, he said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed, as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies." Thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, plural. Are you the seed of Abraham? Yes. You are to possess the gate of your enemies. What are you saying, Brother Phil? The covenant is saying this. As opposed to hell prevailing against us, we are prevailing against hell. 
the, the gates will not prevail. Or in other words, the gates will not stand up against our faith, against our onslaught against the enemy. The gates will not be able to stay erect and stand up where we can't get in there. We're going to knock down those gates and we're going to take back everything the devil's stolen from us and we're going to reach in and we're going to take our unsaved loved ones and our unsaved family members and we're going to draw them into the kingdom of God. The gates of hell are not strong enough against our faith in our covenant keeping God. Hmm. Please notice that the word seed is singular. The word seed is singular. <sighs> Let's go back to Hebrews 10. I hope you're enjoying this as much as I'm in preaching it. Amen. Hebrews 10. I want to try and get this all finished at a decent time. Hebrews 10. 12. <laughs> Have you ever thought, what's Jesus doing right now? What's he doing? Sitting at the right hand of the fire. You think he's watching reruns of Leave it to Beaver? <laughs> Maybe he likes I Love Lucy. Maybe he's a Star Trek fan like I was. No, Phil, he's, he's praying for us. He ever lives to make intercession for us. That's right. Here's something else he's doing. And Hebrews, <laughs> verse, uh, chapter 10, verse, uh, where we at? verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting. Oh, he's got some hope. Jesus has some hope. He's expecting. What's he expecting? Till his enemies be made his footstool. Jesus is expecting you and I to take our covenant authority and put the devil underneath our feet. Because we are the body of Christ. So he's not doing anything other than praying for us. He's just sitting up there and he's expecting. He's expecting. And so here's what he would like. Sitting at the Father's right hand and he looks down at you and I. And he sees the mess going on. And what he would love to hear is for you and I to come boldly to the throne of grace and say, now Jesus, don't get up. Don't get up. The devil's attacked my family. But I'm going to take the authority you've given me and I'm going to bust him in the head. Amen. I'm going to use the word on him. I'm going to use the name. On, just sit right there. Don't, don't get up. I got this. I got this, Jesus. I got this one. You're expecting me to put the devil underneath our feet by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. That's exactly what I'm going to do. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. This is the way most Christians are. Jesus. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. It's so bad. It's so bad. It's so bad. Jesus, you just don't know how bad it is. That's not what he's expecting. <laughs> That's not what he's expecting. That is a Christian who is, who is without hope and doesn't know his covenant. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> this has been a wild, crazy message. <laughs> Man, I'm glad I'm not being filmed. <laughs> Let's try and close it with Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3. Maybe there's a reason why I'm not on TV yet. <laughs> Galatians 3.16. <laughs> now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. Hmm. So when God was making promise to Abraham, he was really talking to Jesus. And he was making promise to Jesus. When God was cutting the covenant with Abraham, he was making covenant with Jesus. 
And part of the covenant was, thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Didn't Jesus do that? Here, here's, this is absolutely, only, the, only in the wisdom of God could God ever come up with this idea. Jesus was in hell for three days and three nights. And then the Father raised him from the dead, given him the new birth. The Bible says Jesus is the firstborn of many brethren. God gave birth to the church in the pit of hell. I would have given birth to, to the church at the throne room of God. But the church was given birth to in the pit of hell. Why? Because we are to possess the gate of our enemies. No devil, temp, uh, it, are, are we uh, terrified by them? Amen. We're terrified by no evil spirit. We're far greater than them. Amen. Now we got a baby in the house today. Hallelujah. Look at this. We have a baby in the house. God gave birth to the church in the pit of hell. The church in its infancy, the church in babyhood stage was birthed with demons all around. And they couldn't stop it from happening. They couldn't stop the new birth from coming to pass. The devil couldn't stop you and I being made the righteousness of God. Thank you. So God made covenant to God, God made covenant to Jesus as he speak to Abraham. Now to Abraham and his seed were, were the promises made. He saith not into seeds as, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. For sake of time, go down to verse number 29. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed singular. And heirs according to the promise. The Bible calls you and I not the seeds of Abraham, but the seed of Abraham. What does that mean? It means that every part of the covenant belongs just as much to you as it does to Abraham. Amen. And it means and it belongs just as much to you as it does Jesus. It belongs just as much to you. There's not one part of that covenant that is less yours than Jesus is. So when God was cutting the covenant with Abraham, he was cutting it with Jesus, but he was also cutting it with you and I. Amen. I promise my last verse, because it's the end of the page. <laughs> You've got to see this. Genesis 17. Everybody say identity, identity. And, destiny. and destiny. We know that that's a big deal for us around here. We teach on that all the time, that your identity determines your destiny. Amen. Your identity and your destiny are so greatly tied together. And if you want a better destiny, you've got to change your identity. Amen. We do our kids a disservice when we ask them, what are you going to do in life? No, no, no. What are you going to be in life? Your do and your who. Remember? Your doing comes out of your who. In Genesis 17, God is making covenant with Abram. And he says to him, in verse number 4, Genesis 17, For as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Please say, thou shalt be, thou shalt be. A, father a father of many nations. Many nations. That's his destiny. That's it. You're going to be that. But then, verse 5, neither shall thy name anymore be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. That's identity. He told him what his destiny was going to be because, I, because he says, you're going to be, that. You're, that's going to happen because I've already made you that. He gave him identity. Covenant identity gives you covenant destiny. Amen. Covenant identity gives you covenant destiny. Our covenant 
is a covenant filled with promises, giving us hope where there is no hope in the natural, giving us expectation, giving us new pictures on the inside, changing our inner image. And those promises are not vain, they're not light. They meant so much to God that he shed the, the blood of his own son. i got to say this in closing that if I took my son, my oldest son, my firstborn son, and if I brought him to you, and if I took a knife and I cut my son right down the middle, and I laid one half here and one half over there, and I stood in the blood of my own son, blood all over me with the knife in my hand, and I say to you, I swear to you that I'll provide your every need. And you knew that I had the resources to do so. You would never doubt again my intent. And that's what the Father has done for us. When he sent Jesus to the whipping post into Calvary, he made a covenant with us in the blood of his Son. How could we ever doubt his intent with us? That he is serious about having a relationship with us, him knowing, uh, us knowing him personally, hearing his voice, being led by him, and him keeping us healthy, him keeping us safe, him keeping us with a, a sound mind, and having plenty of money. Amen. Please say this, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus I, will I will never lose my mind. Lose my mind. I, will never lose my mind. I will never lose my mind. I will never go out of my mind. I will always have a sharp mind. I am able to remember things both small and great. I have, and I will always have, the mind of Christ. I will never lose my mind. Nor will I ever make a joke about losing my mind. I will never again Make a joke about somebody else's memory. I have a covenant identity and I have a covenant destiny. Thank you so much for listening to this message today and being a part. Until next time we gather around the good word of God, remember these words. Be not afraid, only believe.